Yeah, and so let's uh, open to Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> and we're not going to cover this whole section, but I do want to uh, at least read uh, this first section. And uh, if you stand with me, these first 20 verses, um, I'll be reading tomorrow morning at home. We, before we open any gifts and so forth, we will always read the Christmas story as tradition and then have a family prayer. So, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Lord, again, we want to thank you for this, this season, uh, this, this season when we can remember uh, the greatest gift ever given, and, and we want to thank you for giving us your son. And Jesus, we want to thank you for coming uh, to save us from our sin and to promise us uh, everlasting life. And so thank you for that. And today we pray that um, our hearts would be open to hear what you would say to us. So bless this time. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can all be seated. <clears throat> and so I entitled this message, the text is going to be down to verse 11. I'm pretty sure we'll make that. But the title of the message uh, is A Perfect Plan. And um, a perfect plan right away eliminates the possibility that the plan could have been orchestrated by God. I mean, by man, <laughs> sorry. It, it just eliminates that possibility that the plan could have been orchestrated by man or woman. And I'll tell you what, it's a reminder every time I do a wedding uh, of that impossibility. You know, because as it, as it is when people are planning their weddings, uh, uh, a bride and a groom, it's one of the most important days, <clears throat> and everything is so important to them, all the details and so forth. But I remember this one uh, wedding <clears throat> that was being planned, and this bride uh, ended up putting down all of her plans from the very beginning of the day in increments of minutes that everything would take place. This is where, this is when we would meet. This is when so-and-so, the, the party will show up. This is when we'll be, you know, taking pictures. This one, and I looked at this list that she gave me and I said, I don't want to, you know, be a wet blanket or I don't want to disappoint you, but this can't happen. 
And she said, why? And I said, well, because you're dealing with lots of people. And every one of them will get it wrong, including yourself, I told her. And sure enough, the day of the wedding, the first couple of minutes, it was just wrecked. And uh, I prepared her for that. Nobody showed up when they were supposed to show up. <clears throat> Nobody did what <clears throat> excuse me, they were supposed to do. And it's that way with man. And yet, <clears throat> we know exactly when the sun's going to rise. Next year, we know when the sun's going to rise. We know when the sun's going to set. We know when the what the tides are going to be. You can go down to anywhere, it's any sporting goods. You get a little tide book. It'll tell you what the tide's going to be next month. You can plan a clamming trip because you'll know when it's going to be minus tide. Why is that? Well, because it's according to God's planning. And God's planning is perfect. And that's why, you know, when we're out hunting, we're every day, okay, so when's shooting light? Well, it's 30 minutes before sunrise. When's sunrise? So we knew to the minute the time we could pull the trigger on our hunting trip. <clears throat> and then also, unfortunately for me, on our elk trip, I knew the minute I couldn't pull the trigger on elk because I seen an elk like a minute after that. So, <clears throat> you know, but the thing is, it was, it, that's how it works with, with God. He set things in motion and it's according to his plan and his plan is perfect. And so when you look at this account here, um, in these first seven verses to start with, we see God's perfect providence. And secondly, we see God's perfect prophecy. And then we see also God's perfect timing. And then we see also God's perfect provision. Perfect. And so to begin with, you see there, it says, and it came to pass in those days <clears throat> that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registers, everyone to his own city. And so there you see God's perfect providence. Now, to develop good theology you have to pay attention to the details given in Scripture. And that what that does is by paying attention to the details of Scripture, it'll keep you from going sideways concerning truth. You know, as uh, you know, it, even tell, it even tells us in uh, Ephesians 4, where it tells us that, you know, what we're prone to is that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now we're prone to that. But if you pay attention to the detail of Scripture, then you can, have, you can stand upon truth. And so here you see God's perfect providence, but when you read this, you would think, really? You know, here... Caesar Augustus gives a decree. In other words, this is a law of a pagan ruler, a command that would then d demand that Joseph would have to go from where he was in Nazareth down to Bethlehem to register for the tax. And you think, that's 75 miles. <clears throat> that's without a car, on a donkey with a wife that is almost ready to deliver. Really? Now, in God's providence, couldn't he just have the, the Roman government go to Nazareth and have, you know, put out a table and have them sign up? So why in God's perfect providence would he cause this to happen? And so, and then you have um, God appointing governments in the perfect timing for these things to take place. But it seems like, what a hassle. And then here God uses the tax system. It's another thing, you're like, wow. Here God is using these particular ways to get 
his plan accomplished. And so, and you know, really, when you look at these things, you would think, well, is this really God? If you were in the middle of this, it would be hard for you to say, this is really God's perfect plan? This is a hassle. <clears throat> you know, this really doesn't make sense. Apply to your own life. <clears throat> Develop good theology. Sometimes the hassles of life in the providence of God is exactly what God has a plan and a purpose to bring you to a place where he wants you. Sometimes we're stubborn. Sometimes we like our comfort zone. Sometimes you might need to be fired so that you'll move on because God's trying to move you on. You know, hopefully if you get fired, it's by a false accusation, not, not nothing you deserve being fired for. You know, but Christians are being fired all the time. Hey, sharing the gospel. Hey, you're out of here. For whatever the reasons. But the point being is that God, good theology is these kinds of things happen according to the will of God. So beware of the zealots. Those are the people that are against government. That are against social order. That are against the law. It's only when we are forced to obey man and not God that we draw the line. But God uses, he appoints governments. You read Romans 13 later. And so here God's perfect providence is being delivered and then also perfect prophecy. Because when you read the next verses 4 and 5, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. I read uh, two prophecies that were given uh, a long time before the birth of Jesus. And... Um, one being in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That one, along with when you read in, uh, in Micah chapter 5, and there there's a prophecy that tells us, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brothers shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide for now. He shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one, sh and, and this one shall be peace. And so there's a prophecy given in the book of, of Isaiah, and uh, it's uh, Spurgeon that uh, he, was, he was talking on this, or writing on this particular uh, verse, and... Um, let me see where I wrote it down here. <clears throat> He's speaking on the Messiah. Hmm, maybe I don't have it in my notes. Yeah, here it is. And so he's speaking uh, on, on Ephrath. And he says, Spurgeon writes, And now, for that word Ephrath, that was the old name of the place which the Jews retained in love, the meaning of it, fruitfulness or abundance, Ah, well was Jesus born in the house of fruitfulness. For whence cometh my fruitfulness and thy fruitfulness, my brother, but from Bethlehem? Our barren hearts never produced one fruit or one flower till they were watered with the Savior's blood. And so here in the prophecy, this was, this was a, a um, prophecy that was, was very familiar to those who would study the Scripture. And uh, Bethlehem was the hometown of David, you know, their, their mighty king. And yet it never really became a real influential town. And so uh, in that prophecy, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born there. And it said there in that verse 2 that whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So although Jesus is born in 
Bethlehem, he was from everlasting. You know, and of course, uh, Revelation twenty two thirteen speaks of Jesus being God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so, um, there's one thing about about the Word of God is, and again, I want to emphasize that the author is God. It wasn't written by men, and uh, the men that were articulate in it were the penmen, you might say the stenographers, uh, for the Lord. But God was the author, or is the author, and that's why the, God's word is inerrant. And um, if man was the author, that wouldn't be the case. And so even Jesus said that not one jot or tittle would pass away until all was fulfilled in Matthew 5.18. So what Jesus was saying, that the word of God would be fulfilled flawlessly. And Paul writes regarding all scripture is God breathe or inspired by God, which is God breathe. And so we can depend upon it. And so also when you consider how complex the scriptures are to all work out and you have all the critics of the history trying to disprove the word, not able to do it. But what's interesting is that the scripture is written over a 1,500-year period by 40 different authors, and yet it's cohesive. And it isn't contradicting itself anywhere. And even the Gospels themselves, the, the New Testament record of Jesus, even there, there is so complex that it could not be a hoax as you know, Bible critics would say, and I like uh, what, the, what the historian Will Durant puts it. He says, um, Will Durant, who devoted his life to the study of records of antiquity, made this observation concerning the accounts of Jesus in the early church in Scripture, that a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful, appealing a personality so lofty and ethic and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. After two centuries of higher criticism, the outlines of life, character, and teaching of Christ remain reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature in the history of Western man. And so not only do you have the, um, the record of scripture uh, that has been fulfilled, but also you have even the Bible proven historically. You know, when you want to talk about things that are tangible, the deeper the archaeologists dig, the more little artifacts and information they gathered that only proves the word of God. And of course, something I always bring up is... Um, is, you know, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which of many manuscripts that were found there in the caves just off the shores of the Dead Sea, in the Qumran cave, that it preserved the material that the word was written on. Because everything that was needed to preserve the writing, one of the scrolls that was there in its entirety, complete, 24 feet by one foot, I think it was, was the, the scroll of Isaiah, which I've just read two of the prophecies uh, there from Isaiah, which there are many more, including the second coming of Christ. But the thing is, is they were, they were dated by the professionals secular uh, also, that they were dated between 150 and 200 years B.C., before Christ. And then the critics would look at those and say, these had to be written after Christ, and they were not. And so although we have this tangible evidence and we have uh, the scriptures being fulfilled Really, we need nothing more than the history and word of God and our faith. 
because really that is unshakable in scripture just in uh in romans eight sixteen, we just finished there but in 16 birth it says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of god and so my faith is unshakable because of the word of god which is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path but when i see the fulfillment of scripture by faith My faith is unshakable because the Spirit of God bears witness with my spirit. And it's the Spirit of God that opens up my eyes to see the truth. And so we have that record, that perfect prophecy, and then we have the perfect timing. These events that took place when you read in chapter 2 verse 6 where it says so it was that while they were there the days were completed for her uh, to be delivered and so there's the perfect timing the events of which are foretold in prophecy and so you have there that uh, mary was to have jesus in bethlehem but they originated in Nazareth. So everything had to be put into motion, all those involved, including the movement of the whole political realm, so that Mary, who was conceived by the miracle of the Holy Spirit in her womb, prior to that, months before, ended up in Bethlehem right when she was going to deliver by God's providence and perfect prophecy that took place. And so you have that perfect uh, prophecy, perfect timing, but then you have the perfect provision. And that could be interesting because when you look at verse 7, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, you and I, you know, once again, pay attention to the details of Scripture, because it develops good theology. And what's the good theology here? Well, (laughs) the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not be in want of any good thing. You know, if I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things shall be added unto me. As Paul would write in Philippians where he would say, I have found that in all things he learned to be content. And then he says in 1 Timothy 6 where he talks there, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. So it would be real easy for Mary as, as mother and Joseph as the father the stepdad there to think i failed i cannot provide for my family my new baby my my new baby is wrapped in rags laying in an animal feed feeding trough wait a minute this is the absolutely perfect provision of god according to his plan (laughs) you know you would think what god couldn't you come up with a better plan than that Shouldn't your son have been born in ivory palace? Well, not according to God's plan. And, and so remember, develop a good theology. So in any situation that God has us, are you loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind? Then you, don't, you can be comp- content in the very things that he's given you. Are you seeking him? Then trust that all that's needed will be added because that is the promises of Scripture. Don't be, you know, measuring yourself up to somebody else. That could be a real bummer. And that is the way of the world, by the way, keeping up with the Joneses. And, you know, I always go on record to say it is for some Christians to be blessed in, you know, an amazing way financially, you know, for many reasons. Like I would say, well, a pastor could be called the Beverly Hills because the people who live in Beverly Hills need Christ too. But in order to minister in Beverly Hills, you're going to have to drive a BMW. You're going to have to, 
you know, live in a really nice house. You're going to have to first get them to say, well, you know, he, you know, he wears decent clothes. You know, he seems to have his life together. I mean, that's just the bait and the fish hooks and things that God uses in our lives. So you see somebody like that, don't judge them, though, you're just living for the world. You have no idea how the Lord's using that individual. But, you know, I'll say that so often, and then others are just giving a lot because they have the gift of giving, and, and they, God needs to keep giving them a lot because they just keep giving it. Whatever the case, and then others, called to be missionaries as an example, are going to go over to some third world country. You think they're going to drive a fancy car and live in a fancy house? No, they're going to live in a hut. And they're going to live just like the people they're ministering to, or else they're not going to make a connection. And so who is it that God has us making a connection to? That's why we need to be true to the ministry that God's given to us and do not point your finger at somebody else and try and judge their situation. And because that's, that's they only need to answer to, to the Lord in what they've been given. <clears throat> that's, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's very important that we understand that. So getting past that, you get to verse 8, and it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so you have there the angel sharing the gospel, declaring it. And then, of course, it's the baton is passed to us, the torch of the gospel to continue that message. But it's interesting that the message was first shared to shepherds. And that's interesting because shepherds had a bad reputation in society they were the ones that kind of had to stay outside of town with the flock sort of like the, the those who were the tanners you know unclean those guys had to be out and this is huge once again developing your theology they were not allowed to give testimony in a court of law so the very shepherds who were given the gospel message were not even allowed to give a testimony in a court of law, man's law, I mean man's court. So I think God's shouting here because the gospel is going forth, the gospel's going forth was not going to be regulated by man's laws. And as history has it, Christians were often and still are at risk to declare the gospel because it doesn't flow with the order of men. But as we have an example given to us, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is that the person receiving the gospel is faithful to give it. Your reputation or your social status has no bearing on it, only that the Holy Spirit would endorse you know empower your your testimony and so the gospel goes forth and then the gospel message was that um there is born to you this day in the city of david and so again the city of david a specific place and very familiar to the people and all those that would study the scripture. And this one, in this one place was one person to be born. He was a, he is the savior who is Christ the Lord. And so it's true that the, the false message of religion is that there's many roads that lead to God. Well, contrary to that is the message of the Bible. And uh, Jesus, as he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No, John 14. And no man comes to the Father except by me. That's a very pointed, exclusive, exclusive uh, statement that he says. And then, you know, it tells us, uh, he says also, without me, you can do nothing. That's very pointed and specific. Jesus tells us in John 15, 5. And so whether you go to the Old Testament, which I will, or the New Testament, the message is the same. In Isaiah 43, 10 through 12, it says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witness, witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. And then in Isaiah 44, verse 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, besides me there is no God. And in verse 8, that same chapter, Do not fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from the, that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And then uh, a couple more verses in Isaiah 45, 5 and 6, where it says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. One more set of verses in that same chapter, Isaiah 45, verse 21, it says, Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no other God besides me? A just God and Savior, there is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall take an oath. Now, I read all those out of Isaiah because of the scroll I just mentioned. There isn't many ways to God. You know, there's one. And of course, you, you know, if you turn to the New Testament, and once again, there's, there's many, many verses. I'm just going to read one, and that's in Acts 4.12 that says, Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Speaking of Jesus Christ. And so, so Jesus, born in Bethlehem, he is, he is the Savior, the only Savior. He is God. He is the Christ, which means, the Christ there, it means the promised Messiah. Because if you go back to the Hebrew language in the Old Testament, Messiah meant the anointed one. The counterpart to that in the New Testament is Christos, Christ, which means the anointed one. And so he came, Christ the Lord, the promised Messiah. And it's interesting because the, the Jewish people they understood that they were to wait for their Messiah. He was promised to them. You go all the way back to Genesis. The promise went to Father Abraham, their father in the faith. And God promised to Abraham that in him and his descendants, all the world would be blessed. And then God told David that I will set up your seed after you and your house and your kingdom shall be established 
Then you go all through the Old Testament, the promise and the fulfilled prophecy of the Messiah, some of which I read. But then when you go to the New Testament and you look at what Jesus says in making the connection there in Isaiah to himself in Luke 4, 18 and 19, where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And you see, that's the hope that we have. That's why we can turn to the Lord for deliverance. That's why we don't have to be in bondage. That's, that's why regardless of what happens, we can have hope and peace. Because Jesus Christ is the deliverer of our hearts and lives. And he's the one that gives us the strength and you know that we turn over our friends and our family to and our relationships and our problems. And we trust him for those things. And so we have that promise. And, and then also... Uh, Lord, it says Christ the Lord. Lord means master. And uh, it means to whom a person or thing belongs about which he has power of deciding. So is Jesus your Lord? Is he your master? The title is given to God the Messiah as Lord, as Savior. And so Jesus had to confront his disciples regarding this. And when he said to them in Luke 4, or actually Luke 6, in 46 through 48, Jesus says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, do, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And so you have, in contrast, the household of faith and one of no faith. But you notice the storm is the same. One would stand, the other fell. And Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and you don't do the things that I ask? He was talking to his disciples. And then he said this in, in John... 13, verses 13 through 17, last verses and we're done. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If then, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you, notice, if you do them. There's a contingency. There's a challenge there. And Christian means Christ-like. That's what the meaning is, Christ-like or little Christs. And so we look at the the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we see that as a king of kings, he came as the servant of all. And then prior to going to the cross, that same, same night, he washed his disciples' feet. Imagine all that weighing upon him, and he's washing his disciples' feet. He's serving. Do as I have done to you. And so when the world looks on and they see the church, they should see a grateful, thankful, contented people all loving on one another, willing to be sacrificial and others-minded. That's the attractive message. But the sad thing is, is too often people look at a church and they see chaos, they see division, they see unthankfulness, 
They see the, the Christians going to live for the world and not for the Lord, and on and on. There's no power in that message. There's no Holy Spirit in that message. None of us are going to be perfect, but we are challenged, aren't we, to love one another, to love God and to love one another. In that, you fulfill the law. And in that, you have the backing and the endorsement of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot live and serve God without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way to do that is to be obedient to the Lord, to stand against the storms of life. And so, praise the Lord that we have that, but we have to make up our minds and whether we're going to be serious about the Lord. And we call him Lord, and we're not just throwing words out and titles, but we're meaning it in our hearts. And we serve the Lord. And, and then we're set free completely, completely to enjoy this life to its utmost. Don't buy into that message that, you know, we need more stuff to be happy. No, what we need is the fullness of the Spirit in our lives. And then whatever we have, we will be content. How many times you heard of somebody who's rich beyond imagination, but they're miserable. They're miserable. They're trying to, you know, somehow have security and hope and peace, and they'd be willing to spend whatever amount of money just to have peace. But instead, they live a miserable life and they lose everything, searching for that peace. Well, we have peace in Christ. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but Jesus said that he is our peace. And so, amen. <laughs> Let's stand together. And we'll pray for our meal as well. Lord, um, thank you for another blessed day that you've given to us. And we don't know the exact day that you were born in history, but we choose this time of the year just to take advantage of celebrating it. And it's a wonderful time. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have to celebrate at this time of the year. And and uh, gift giving because we just once again we just follow suit you're the great greatest gift giver and so help us lord to bless others at this time we thank you for the food you provided and all those diligent to prepare it and to serve it and and so god uh, i pray for all those that are here i ask uh, your will in their life i ask that they would have a hearing ear and that Whatever it is that, Lord, you might put your finger upon, whether it is to encourage them or to correct them. Either way, Lord, we know that you love us and that you have our best in mind. And so I pray for all that are here that, Lord, you would have your way in their life. So we thank you that we can call upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.